start. Okay, so now we would be live if anyone's watching. It's all right. magical. It's all okay. So there, there it goes. Okay, and then um, don't be scared. I also have sound effects that I put in, just in case. Because what podcast would be without sound? I don't know. My podcast would be really boring without sound effects. So <laughs> awesome. anyway, all right, here we go. All right, so I usually go. John, edit here. Hello and welcome to Teaching in Beta. Yes, Techlandia is moving over to the Teaching in Beta podcast. This will be the premiere episode, and I'll be your host, John Samuelson, up in Portland, Oregon, and I guess I'll be the only host right now, but we have a very special guest who's just over on what we like to call the Pacific Standard Time for a little bit, so we decided that we would get Natalie uh, Rusk here, and she is from the MIT Media Lab, and Natalie, would you mind telling us a little bit about what you do? Sure. So I've worked on the development of the Scratch programming language since the beginning, since we were first planning it. And I've done work before that at MIT related to engaging young people and learning through creating projects based on their interests, including starting with way back when, decades ago, with the first programmable Lego is what attracted me there. Seymour Papert was teaching a course. Ever since then, I've been collaborating, especially with Mitch Resnick, who leads up the Lifelong Kindergarten Group. And we've been creating opportunities for young people to, like I said, learn through creating projects based on their interests using a variety of tools. But over the last 10 years since we launched Scratch, a lot of our work has been in really continuing to improve the Scratch website. And I do a lot with um, making materials such as the Scratch tutorials and Scratch cards, working with others to create starter projects, different ways to get young people engaged in starting to create projects based on their ideas and on their interests. That sounds so cool. So it's been, so it's 10 years old, Scratch is, huh? Right, in May oh, wow. of this year, 2017, Wow. Scratch will okay. have launched, it first launched in May 2007. So we're wow, excited to be easy. celebrating its 10th anniversary and to see, we're learning more and more about young people who started when they were young and to see how they've developed over time and what they're doing now with what they've learned and created on Scratch. It's really inspiring for us. That's really cool. So do you have, you actually have some of those students, you have like a little focus group where you have some, of course you do, but you have some students that started in 2007 and you can track where they are a decade later. We, we started, we hear from more and more of them that they say, hey, I wanna let you know, I wanna thank you for, you got me started in this area and now I'm combining my interest, either it might be in art and computer science or some of them are going in different directions. Some are going more into the art direction, some into engineering, computer science, just all different types of ways that young people are seeing that their interests, they can take whatever they're interested in and use once they are able to learn about programming to and coding to really create things that connect with their interests, which just makes them wanna keep on going. So a lot of it has been just us hearing from some of them we've we gotten to know in the online community early on and others of them are writing to us now, hey, I wanted to let you know and thank you. And some of them are out there on their own teaching others how to do it, providing opportunities for younger students to learn how to create with Scratch. That's awesome. That is so awesome. Yeah. I know why. Well, all right, so I, lo I love Scratch. I'm very... Um, uh, honored to talk to you because I, I think that it's just amazing what a platform scratch is and I think one of the things that really um, I, I work at a district level I'm what we call a, a TOSA and so a TOSA is stands for teachers out at Starbucks all the time <laughs> so anyway but that's my little joke but um so I work at a district level and I think one of the things that um, was a I, I worked at getting kids on on Scratch in the elementary schools last year, and we'd have to go through the thing where um, you'd send them, you know, you'd have to have the parent email and things like that. And the, whoever thought of the student sign up this year and the teacher accounts, I mean, it just makes it so much easier for me to scale up from that kind of a standpoint. What made what made you guys decide to do that this year? That's really um, it's something that has been thought about and talked about a lot 
Karen Brennan at who leads the Scratch Ed site. She's been asking about that through her work with teachers. She's based at Harvard now and Harvard Education School. And she had heard from a lot of teachers and educators. So then others on our team really worked with her and her team and had it tried it out with uh, educators in a variety of settings to really figure out what were the basic functionality. It was a lot of work to get that going. But now that we have those availability of teachers going to the Scratch Educator page, you can request one of those Scratch teacher accounts that lets you, as you saw, make classes with students. And it's a way to make it a lot easier to manage and not to have to have every student confirm their email. You can just do it for them, setting up accounts for them. So I'm glad to hear that that's working because it was a big investment of effort on our team. But And we know that there's a lot of functionality people want, but what we have there are the basics that hopefully will really help with managing classes of students and making that process a lot easier. No, I mean, I think that the, the difference between last year and this year is it's so much easier. Have you seen a lot more people and teachers request accounts and sign up then? Have, are yes. you privy to that? Okay. Yeah, was, yeah. We're so. seeing a growing number of people really making use of it. And we're getting positive feedback about the ability to manage accounts in that way. It was interesting because, um, like I said, I told you a little bit before. So I, I led a session. Um, I think it was my title was, okay, you ready for my title, Natalie? Yeah, it's, I was wondering. All right, coding an itch that every teacher can scratch. <laughs> Gosh, I hate those titles. But so anyway, so that, I did that session. And um, so what we did was I um, I got some consulting from my friend Scott Bedley from the Bedley Brothers podcast. And what we did was I, I have it over here on my little whiteboard where I went through and I did what I would normally do for a session. And then I just looked at it and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to flip it completely upside down and start from the bottom, kind of like Drake, and then just go backwards. So I, I, I made some accounts for them and just gave them and, and made them work in pairs and then just said, okay, we're going for it right here. We're going to do the animate your name right off the bat. So they had, and I just gave them a little bit of basics, like here's how you change a sprite. Here's how you change a background. And you have to have, uh, you know, hit the green flag for the, you know, the function. Now I'm going to forget what it is, but right, you have to start with, tell the computer what to do. And so you're going to use the green flag because I think that's the easiest one for people to understand. And uh, yeah, they just started doing animate your name right off the bat. And I tried to see who could go through and, and publish and share one right off the bat. And um, I'm just wondering, do you think that's the right way to train? Do you, because I feel like some teachers don't have any concept and they get scared. And then I could go through and I could tell them for 20 minutes why they should move their students to coding and computer science. But I thought just to throw it at them because it, it is so much easier for the students. And I feel like you just need to just start and yep. get going. I think that that's a great way to really start rather than thinking about how do I code, how do I scratch, what's something I want to make? We really, really like that approach because it's much more engaging for many more educators and young people to think, oh, okay, I want to animate my name or animate the letters of somebody's name, my pet, my friend, myself, and take a letter and just start experimenting. And that's what we hear from a lot of the young people who have gotten involved in Scratch and get really engaged is, it starts with experimenting and exploring and realizing there's not a right or a wrong way. Just like when you're putting together bricks or Lego bricks, you don't get an error message. You get to, you just start experimenting and start tinkering and building something up. And we design Scratch in that way that it doesn't give you error messages. It has ways you can snap things together and you just start trying. And that's what makes it more fun. And it gives you confidence to realize there's not a wrong way to do it. Once you start trying, and that's why we have some of those materials like the scratch cards that show how you could just snap together two blocks. You can start making a letter spin. You can make it change color. And you start feeling the empowerment of being able to decide what kind of letter do I want? What do I want it to do? Try this, try that. And from there, you really start building. So I really like that approach of starting with something like animating your name or making some music or making a dance 
starting with something where you have an idea in your head and you explore, start experimenting, and you have something to share with other people. And that's really also what keeps young people wanting to do Scratch is they make something and they're like, oh, that's cool, let me show you. And everyone has something different and you can start learning from each other. Oh, what? how did you do that? Let me show you. And that's what creates that culture of learning and creativity around it that really motivates and makes people want to keep going with it. Yeah, I think that that's not, I think that um, with the classroom accounts too, it's much easier to see. Here's the big mistake I made. Of course, I'm always willing to share when I make a mistake and admit that I'm not the greatest and I don't like come in the room and gumdrops rain down and <laughs> the fireworks go off. But uh, I had uh, done it with a bunch of students and then I didn't have them share their project. So when it came time for me to make studios because I wanted to share things out, I didn't, they weren't published, so I didn't have them. And I was like, okay, but then then you, you live and learn, right? So then I was yeah. like, okay, now now it's the first thing I remember to tell kids. <laughs> but I just thought that was funny. Here I thought I was gonna have all these great boards and projects from these 10 classes that I had done. And I was like, oh, I've got hardly anything. A couple of them that had accounts before did know how to do it. So then thank them for actually knowing how to do things. But um, yeah, so I, I was gonna ask you, um, how many, um, this is a question that's been on my mind that I'm dying to ask Ask you is, so I'm, uh, what I was trying to tell people at the conference and what I, throughout my district is that this Scratch, when I saw that Scratch, you could like use it to make Mad Libs, you can use it for presentations and storytelling and all these things. I just thought, how many lessons or how many how much time do you think it, it takes before you know teachers are always kind of scared of what they don't know and so i mean i'll be the first to admit that i don't have the answers to everything when i'm trying to like debug something that doesn't work the way they think it is or try and kind of help them think back through it. i'm getting better at telling them how to think through it and and experiment back and see what it is but um do, do you think that scratch could be like like we'll just use the old basic PowerPoint as a choice. Do you think that like Scratch could be an option for like here, I'm gonna demonstrate my learning on like the Oregon Trail and I'm gonna make up a little Scratch program. How, how long, how much do you think kids have to work before it just becomes intuitive for them? Or how many, how many lessons do you think we have to do out of the Scratch coding cards? to get them kind of going so they can start just kind of using it as an option every day throughout their regular curriculum? I think that's a great question. And it probably does depend on how engaged they get with it um, and how much, I think the more that you can encourage that exploration and experimenting, they start to learn really quickly. And the more that they can share with each other, sharing what's something that you learn, share something you know, and having I think a lot of we've learned from educators seeing how they have strategies for students to problem solve, like ask someone first, here are these cards you can look at, here are resources online. So the more that you have resources that they can start to use, they start the learning then just accelerate. So I think, and that really is, I think it's the right question that a lot of people don't ask, but it is, it's like learning ABCs and once you start to get realize that with this alphabet, I can create anything. I can say anything I want in the language. Too often people think it's about, well, you learn a little bit of scratch and you go to the next language. And to me, that's like saying you learn your ABCs and you go on to the next language. Whereas really, <laughs> once you start understanding that with these fundamental blocks of moving things, making sounds and changing how things look, you can make all those different things that you talked about. You can make animations, games, stories. So I would say, yeah, we really developed the scratch coding card so that I would say after making about three or four projects, you start to see, oh, these same blocks, you can do a lot of different things with it. And the more that you see them used in different contexts, you start to realize, oh, well, what if I wanted to try this? I, I could start remixing those. So. Um, I think it often works really great if you can have in a school or a school district, the more that people start to recognize that Scratch is a tool across the curriculum, and then that initial investment in time of kids starting to learn it then pays off where they can use it across different subject areas. And it is a much richer learning experience and uh, social experience within the physical group of sharing or eventually when people want to share online. Um, that uh, 
that's that really and even some people are doing scratch junior starting at younger grades then kids are going to pick it up a lot faster if they've had some of those initial experiences with understanding snapping together blocks but i guess i would say i think you know after three or four projects they start to get the idea then of course the more that they want to experiment and play with it the more fluent they're going to become with it Okay, that's good because right, that's the thing that I noticed. So it's like I was sitting there and we were talking a little bit about my session before it happened. And then I still, I, I'll say this on, I've said this on hundreds of Techlandias probably, now teaching a beta, product placement right there. But uh, it's always time for the teachers, right? They're like, I don't have time to teach another subject and things like that. And I thought, boy, if, if, um, if we could really get the teachers to kind of focus down a little bit, or if there's, you know, sometimes there's in our district there for elementary, there is separate computer lab time. And if we could just get in there really early in the year, or even like, I always remember the first week when I actually was a teacher, not out at Starbucks all the time, like we would, you know, you're just setting rules and expectations and, and really kind of focused. But boy, I think that if you could infuse some scratch right out, like the animate your name or create a, you know, make animate someone flying or create a pong game, I feel like if you could do some of those right off the bat, you would be set up so nicely for the rest of the year. And you'd be, and if you just let the kids go a little bit, you'd be surprised at what, what they could do because it would be things that you hadn't even thought of. Yeah, I think that's so true. So, and as you mentioned, so we have the scratch cards that are available free online, as well as buying them in a box set that from No Starch Press that's also right on here. Amazon and other resellers. Um, sellers. So there's you can get them online to download and print them. You could get them in a box. Um, there's these online tutorials that when you go into Scratch, click Create, that you can see that match those. So you could either use the online ones, you can use them with the physical printed out cards. There's also the Scratch Ed has a creative computing guide that has a whole bunch of resources within it that really is designed for using in school and showing a progression and ways for students to learn from each other, give each other feedback. So that's another great resource that is available. I think that um, one of the things that I noticed um, with the scratch coding cards is, and I, I do have a couple more questions with it. So I did show the teachers that, that basically don't almost all of them line up with the question mark on the right side as you're creating. Like you can take it through animate your name, but there's one in the coding cards that's not on the side. Is Am I right with that? And I just Actually, wanted to ask Actually, it's there now. There's okay. in the box. So in the box, there's 10 different themes, including okay. creating a story, virtual pet, animate your name, as you mentioned. So all 10 of those now, there were two that weren't, but as of this week now, all oh, 10 okay. of them are there. Plus there's one extra, which is the make it fly, which you can okay. download from the Scratch site and you can use there. So yeah, now they're all available. So you can have these online tutorials that go with them. You know, and you can use both. Some kids might like to hold the physical cards. Some might be fine using what's in there. So in the tips window. And then mm -hmm. for each of them on the, if you go to the Scratch, it's called the Things to Try page. If you go to Scratch website and do slash go, they now have all the resources there as well as an educator guide for each one that suggests a way that you could get students started for about an hour long course. If, class that you, or workshop that you want to lead on say animate your name or on um, creating your own story so that just gives some ideas of how to facilitate how to introduce it how to have ways to share so it's just uh we tried to make that really easy for to help think out how you might lead a session on them okay because i remember that was like the big aha moment for some of the people you know some of the people are at, at my um, session are probably just like, oh my gosh, who is this doofus trying to teach us Scratch? They People think I'm a doofus, Natalie. I'm sorry. I don't know why. I don't know why. But um, so it was funny because I'm like, it's all right here on this question mark. They're like, oh, there's videos with tutorials and step-by-step -step directions. And I feel like that provides the crutch maybe that teachers maybe crave a little bit. I'm, I'm always never afraid to fail. And I was always 
never afraid to like get in there and be like, okay, we messed that one up. We'll try, you know, we'll dust ourselves off and we'll try again tomorrow. But I feel like if more teachers knew that, I mean, the coding cards I think are awesome and I've bought two extra sets because I've just been trying to pass them out to people. But um, I mean, really it's all just right there on the question mark on, on the Scratch website if you're creating things, right? Yep, so right when you go into create on the right hand side, there's that tips window. And yep, all the tutorials are there as well as now having cards if you want to use those in addition, although you don't need to. But, and the cool thing about the cards is each one, it's a way to, for some kids doing a whole tutorial to follow all the way through might not be, you know, to keep them engaged and following all of it. Whereas the cards, they really like a tutorial, but each card, you pick it up, you get a result right away from mm -hmm. it. You get a, and you learn a little bit of coding and you get to see what it does. And if you use them in a series or mix them up, you can create something. And we really try to, so it, it really is a step-by-step -step thing, but it tries to encourage, hey, try this, or you could use your own images. So it, it lets you customize, but it also is. So if you didn't, you know, as a teacher, if you don't already feel comfortable, I still, I think that by handing those out or by using, like you said, in the tips window with the question mark, it really does show everything you need to create a project. And then it is about more helping with the problem solving. And often it is just getting kids to talk out, what were you trying to do? What does it do first? Okay, let's just try this little bit. So it's more, it's less about having to know everything about Scratch and it's more about just helping them talk out what they're trying to do and think it out or find a way around it in that problem solving process that's useful in anything you do. And I just think that we hear that a lot from actually from parents as well as teachers that the main, one of the main things they, that they see kids getting out of scratch is starting to see thinking more systematically and problem solving and gaining more confidence in that problem solving. We hear about it from kids directly where they say, I gain confidence just because it's, it's designed to, you try something out, you see, does it work or not? And you just start changing it and figuring out it, what do I want it to do? What is it doing? And doing that problem solving. It's giving feedback directly rather than it doesn't tell you right or wrong, but you see the results of your actions and you see if it matches what you wanted. And that's a really powerful and empowering process for kids. I think it is. I mean, that's what you want is you want, you know, it's these soft skills. I mean, is that, that's why you, I, I, we haven't been doing that as much. And I, I wish that I would move over a little bit. Maybe I'll, I'll get my nerve up someday, but we haven't been doing like people together, like two kids on one computer. We have enough computers in the lab where I've been teaching a lot of the lessons where they each kind of have their own, but we have been encouraging them to kind of, I've been encouraging them to share and help, but that's not really the same thing mm -hmm. as like having a driver. And so when we did the uh, teacher session, I did really encourage them to try and pair up and only use one computer just to kind of use them as my tech. They were, I thought they seemed pretty into it. It was very quiet for a while. And I kept kind of looking back and like, oh, who's checking their email? But there there were, most of them were not. I mean, there's always going to be one person that checks their email, but I was looking at them. They were really, they were really trying to get it going there. And I think what I like about the cards is that, right, it's like they, if they don't want to go through a step-by-step -step tutorial, like they just want to make their letters spin for animate your name. I can just go, here you go, here's your card. Yep. And then they can go through and kind of add to what they've already gone. It's kind of like, um, I don't know, it's just like kind of like a a la carte menu, if you yep. do it that way, you know? Yeah. Yep. So, so as we finish up, I know you're t I know that you're, uh, you're t I don't want to take too much of your time. What do you think is the one way to get teachers that are a little bit hesitant? What do you think is the one thing, like maybe there are some people out, out there like, myself that are you know not teachers at starbucks out of the all the time but trying to support teachers teachers in a supporting uh, role what do you think is some way that we could support or the best way to get teachers that might be like oh i'm really scared it's coding i'm super scared what do you think is the 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 secret sauce to get them going a little bit that's a good question i guess a couple things one that you mentioned is having them try something that is engaging and like taking one of those sets of cards and having them try it out. And uh, so I think that's one way, having that experience themselves and getting the joy of seeing something you coded come to life and sharing that with someone else. I think another way is to find something on the Scratch site 
often if you'll search for something, you'll find a couple projects on whatever it is. What is the passion that that teacher has, say, teaching about Egypt or about the environment or a certain book, Charlotte's Web, or whatever it is, looking online and finding some example projects and seeing what other students and teachers have done can be a really inspiring. And then to see, okay, how might we do that? I think those are both some really good ways. One other way I would say is watching kids do it. Like you said, often to see so many educators are so surprised when they see their kids diving in, exploring, and some of the kids who often will sit back on other things or be a little bit passive when it comes to say just, for example, you know, math, but when they're starting to experiment with numbers and scratch and they see immediate effects of their actions, some of the kids really coming to life. That's another way that can really inspire to think, okay, I could do this because I'm seeing that kids are learning on their own and experimenting and sharing with each other. So maybe this is possible for me to do. I think any of those are some good ways to start. Okay, well, I, I'm trying. So just know that I'm trying. I'm, I'm like number one <laughs> fan out there right now. So that's why it's good. Um, I was wondering if you're aware just real quick uh, of the uh, website Code Campus. Do you know Code Campus? I, I just heard about that. So and I was interested to learn more. Actually, a young person told me about it. Um, one of the scratchers. So yeah, okay, what do you so, think about that? So I, I, I went through it. Well, of course, I'm, I'm a complete um, just nut for that stuff. So I went through all their lessons in in one sitting. So I earned all the badges. But I thought it was really nice how um, I'm really encouraging my teachers and people that I know. I mean, it's a free website and he has his, you know, his Vimeo videos. Of course, that's one of the things like Vimeo's blocked in our district or whatever. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, so you have to kind of do it at home. But so he has his Vimeo videos and then you can just, you can have Scratch open at the bottom or I just opened it mm -hmm. in a separate window on my computer and you can really just watch the video and it's built for teachers to teach them how to teach with Scratch. And then if you go over to the other side of it, they have lesson plans that are broken down pretty much by elementary, and they even have some great Scratch Junior lesson plans for it. So he has like 36 weeks of lesson plans, and it's all free. Oh, that's great. So and you I, I know. don't even know about all the things happening okay. with Scratch. Okay. So I'm going to have to look closer at that. Yeah. Okay, so I just I, that's good. Well, I I would be curious to see what you think about it when when it's uh, all said and done because it does. You have like eight badges, and I was I'm I'm really thinking that if if teachers were really curious, I mean, it some of the lessons are just like you can sit down for a half an hour and watch a video, and then you can build the you know make it fly. That's where I saw the Mad Libs and things like that, and it started to really open my eyes. My eyes were already open anyway, but then I was just like it just like all hit me. I'm like we've got to really push this so that we're ready for next year. And we can just hit the ground running that's in our great, school district. Uh, that's great well, to hear how you're introducing it to a lot of people and just encouraging people to try it out is great. Well, uh, thanks. And I mean, we're we're happy with all the happy 10 year anniversary of Scratch. We're really happy that, you know, that it's there. And uh, I think it's really opening up a lot of possibilities for students everywhere. And um, yeah, keep up the good work there because um, that's great. Is Are there any, I, I saw just today that there are some conferences around in different countries besides the United States. Are there any learning opportunities for teachers that might be listening coming up at all? Yeah, I guess. Well, so one thing to check out on the Scratch Ed site that there's meetups that educators themselves are organizing in different cities around country and beyond. And then, as you mentioned, for so every other year we have a Scratch conference at MIT, but on the odd, the, um, the odd, number the odd years, numbered yeah. years, like now there's going to be in, say, in Bordeaux, France, in Budapest, in China, there's different people organizing. In Brazil, there'll be Scratch conferences. There's also one great another great opportunity is on Scratch to hold your own Scratch day. And that can be at a school or anywhere. So in May, to celebrate the anniversary of Scratch, we encourage people, and there have been hundreds of events around the world. They can be very small or larger, but there's a lot of information on our site. If you go to day.scratch.mit.edu, there's all these suggestions for how you could host your own Scratch Day, bringing together young people, parents, educators. You can decide who 
you might want to invite and bring together. And it's a great way to celebrate it. And for those who know some about Scratch to share what they know, to introduce it to, to new people as well. Okay, that's great. I, you know, I was heartbroken because I think I saw the one that was at MIT six days on Twitter. I saw it six days before it was actually like, they're like, we still have some spots open. And I was like, oh my goodness, there's just no way I could do it. But it was like in August, I think. And I was like, oh, that's too bad. That was a bit, but we do have some uh, educators here and I've been to both the Portland Scratch educator meetup so that's great we, we've, we've started here in portland and i forgot about scratch day so i'll get that maybe that'll be my big kickoff for next year so that i can feel i can tell people that'll be the little catapult that gets us going back in august and september that's great well thank you for being on here and taking the time we totally appreciate yeah. it and uh i don't know at some point maybe i'll buy up one more set of scratch coding cards and we'll raffle them off on the show or something like that that's great Okay. Well, great talking to you, Jeff. Yes, thanks. Talk. Thanks for your time, Natalie. We appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.